<laughs> Thank you, uh, Sabina. Thanks for the invitation, uh, which indeed goes back um, to sometime last year when you approached me about um, the exhibition History Tales and um, yeah, in discussing um, sort of the various uh, elements, um, the various components of the exhibition, I then homed in on um, some new works by Alexander Kluge. Um, this also connected to uh, sort of a long-standing interest I have in his practice. Um, and of course, um, yeah, within the context of the exhibition, it also connects to my interests um, in um, forms of historical reenactment, forms of historicism, um, artistic um, engagements with uh, the historicity of, uh, of images, um, in particular also through moving images. Uh, but yeah, my focus is in a sense, in this case, monographic. Um, my talk here is also then a fairly monographic um, talk. Um, I'm not going to sort of treat you to the kind of um, theoretical fireworks that Joshua Simon, for instance, just treated some of us to, but hey, it's, you know, Friday night and we've all been through a lot, or many of us have been through a lot in the last couple of days, so in a way I will be quite um, conventional, traditional, and uh, modest um, in uh, that I want to contextualize some of these new pieces by Alexander Kluge, which we can see in the exhibition. I want to contextualize them um, in the um, sort of um, framework of his overall decades long, uh, more than half a century long um, practice, uh, literary, uh, cinematic, theoretical practice. And um, let me just start with um, maybe a couple of pages from uh, the 2017 exhibition catalog, um, Pluriversum, a uh, catalog of a large Alexander Kluge exhibition in Essen at the Museum Folkwang. So here we see some of these sort of typical Klugian phrases that are also really relevant for the work in the exhibition. We have anti-realismus des Gefühls, and then we have these terms there, Eigensinn, and also Möglichkeitssinn. And Möglichkeitssinn is this a sort of typical sort of Klugian uh, coinage, right? A sense uh, of possibility, not a, a kind of realitätssinn that is sort of stuck in reality as a consensual construct, right? That would be uh, a kind of all too mundane, uh, conventional, um, conservative realitätssinn. This is about the Möglichkeitssinn, a certain sense for um, possibility, for possibilities, uh, for potentialities. Um, and here we also have this wonderful Klugian sentence, dies schärfste Ideologie, dass die Realität sich auf ihren realistischen Charakter beruft. Uh, so this kind of ideological, um, uh, ideo sort of this ideological uh, weight, if you will, of reality as something that lays claim precisely to being realistic, uh, right? So Kluge, um, also uh, said some very um, sort of pertinent things about this as far back as an interview that he gave um, in 1974. So I'm just going to quote briefly now from my, um, yeah, from this 1974 interview, which is also directly relevant, I would say, to the works uh, in uh, the exhibition History Tales. Um, so Kluge here says, I quote, what you notice as realistic, given the way our senses have been educated, right? This is also about the human senses having been educated, having been, having been trained in a certain way. And given the way our senses have been educated, it is not necessarily or certainly real, right? What we see as realistic, what you notice as realistic is not necessarily or certainly real. The potential and the historical roots and the detours of possibilities also belong to reality. The potential and the historical roots and the detours of possibilities also belong to reality. The, real, the realistic result, the actual result, is only an abstraction that has murdered all other possibilities for the moment, right? And this phrase of possibilities having been murdered, right, for the moment is also one that is particularly resonant, I would say, at this historical moment, right, when a kind of, um, yeah, when the das bleierne Gewicht, right, the, the sort of leaden weight of a certain consensual ideological reality um, has indeed murdered all kinds of possibilities or all kinds of possibilities have been foreclosed for the moment, to put it in less graphic terms. But Kluge continues, these possibilities will recur. 
This is why I don't believe too much in documentary realism, because it doesn't describe reality. The most ideological illusion of all would be to believe that documentary realism is realism. Right? So here we have Kluge in the context also, of course, of um, the, the, let's say the rediscovery of certain political uh, forms of, of uh, productivism from the 1920s and 30s in the late 1960s and early 70s, right? The rediscovery of uh, all kinds of political yeah, documentary filmmaking uh, by Soviet filmmakers, by Western filmmakers such as uh, Joris Evans, for instance, in the context of, yeah, also the rediscovery of those historical uh, practices from the 20s and 30s and of those debates, Kluge um, cautions us against um, buying into any particular ideology of uh, realism that sticks to the visible facts or um, supposedly um, certain facts, right? So we need, in a sense, uh, a realism of possibility, a realism of uh, potentiality. Kluge also maintains that at any moment there are futures that are waiting to be born, right? Die warten darauf, geboren zu werden, as he would uh, put it, but they may be biding their time for the time being due to various circumstances. So this just as a, as a, as a little introduction also, or as a way of, let's say, entering these new pieces by Kluge, uh, some of which uh, are indeed on view in um, history tales and some others will be substituted or added uh, later on in uh, February. Um, and um, yeah, um, I just want to um, show you now uh, and perhaps we can just indeed uh, run this video while I keep talking and in this case I think we uh, would also, yeah, we have Alexander Kluge's permission pretty much also to turn down uh, the volume and to kind of uh, dispense with the music or have the music as a very low, uh, at a very low volume. So this is Digitale Kommentare zu dem Bild Triumphale Einzug Henri des Vierten um, in um, uh, Paris. Um, so this is um, based on this painting, uh, okay, it's already gone, this painting by Peter Paul Rubens, um, a sketch, a large oil sketch, showing indeed um, Henri IV's triumphal entry in Paris in um, 1594, and what we see then here in sort of conjunction with this painting or fragments of this painting are mostly um, new images, uh, oniric images created by Kluge in a, a kind of dialogue, uh, or perhaps we could say in a kind of game, a kind of chess game with uh, stable diffusion, with the AI image generator. Uh, stable diffusion. Now, um, here we cannot really get into this very fundamental uh, debate about a AI being uh, f amounting to a form of intelligence or rather uh, not. Uh, Kluge indeed would uh, beg to um, differ and would say that AI is not intelligence. He would say it is nicht Intelligenz, it is Fleiß. It is basically a kind of diligence or industry. It is hard work, right? Uh, what AI amounts to is a lot of in Marxian terms, one could say dead labor, uh, right? But of course, it is then also um, dead labor in the form of a machine that yeah, makes us do uh, a lot of work, right? That that indeed um, uh, turns us into un, um, un uh, uh, remunerated uh, workers uh, using this software. And Kluge tries to use it in ways that um, sort of counteract the tendency for um, the production of all too predictable results, right? A certain sort of uh, absurdist, surrealist photorealism, okay, uh, create an image for me of an astronaut riding a horse on the moon, right? So he um, basically engages in a, a more complicated uh, sort of um, back and forth with stable diffusion um, to create alternative images of Henri IV's a triumphal entry in Paris. Um, so in the exhibition, this is also contextualized in relation to other, uh, pro other processions, right, in the genre. This, of course, is a certain uh, early modern Baroque uh, performative genre, right, the triumphal entry, the triumphal procession with roots in antiquity, obviously. Um, this is a form of, um, yeah, of theater. It's, um, it's a performance of sovereignty, right? It's a performance of sovereign power uh, by a ruler such as uh, Henri IV, Henri IV, um, and artists such as Rubens 
uh, did not just work as painters, let's say, documenting, representing these entries, these processions, but they were also involved in producing them in the first place, right? Rubens was a kind of multimedia uh, propaganda artist also who arranged such spectacles, even though he didn't arrange this one. Um, so for Kluge, what is also relevant here is that uh, this moment of Henri Quatre entering Paris is indeed a moment that um, suggests that there is uh, a potential here uh, that was indeed quite literally murdered, right? When Henri Quatre was later murdered, uh, for Kluge, this basically meant that Europe uh, was sort of then set on its course, a course that would lead to the Thirty Years' War, right? So for Kluge, this um, moment in, let's say, the history of sovereignty, uh, this particular monarch, uh, would have been then a monarch that might have given uh, history sort of, um, or might have taken history into a, a different uh, direction. Of course, we can also question whether, you know, that in itself already runs the risk of reducing history to um, a series of um, yeah, leviathans as ultimately embodied by uh, the monarch, right? Um, whether indeed perhaps in Kluge sometimes there is also increasingly a tendency to equate history with history as made on uh, the battlefield, uh, but I will um, uh, return to that later, come back to that later. Um, for now, I would indeed say that, yeah, here we see that Kluge is using stable diffusion in particular to create sort of um, oniric images that, of course, do not amount to any um, sort of, uh, let's say, genuine actualization of a lost sort of uh, moment of, uh, yeah, a lost historical possibility, right? Of course, there is no suggestion here that, in a way, um, um, the clock can be turned backwards or that the arrow of time can be reversed, uh, can ever be truly reversed. But there is certainly a strong suggestion here that um, there are these uh, murdered, dead, undead, latent, dormant possibilities that, indeed, we can and must engage with in some uh, manner, right? It's obviously not about sort of um, uh, cryogenically uh, uh, unfreezing um, any uh, sort of um, uh, historical ruler, but it is about engaging with these moments when something was indeed uh, murdered. Um, when the uh, sort of um, when the range um, sort of of historical options was severely and brutally uh, limited. Here, um, yeah, we also see that in Kluge's work, indeed, uh, there is this dialectical image, uh, a dialectical image actually composed of dialectical images, we might say. I here made this montage of, um, yeah, a page again from the Pluriversum catalog uh, about uh, Revolution, right? Wörtlich übersetzt Umwälzung wegwälzen. So the importance, of course, of the revolution, of political revolutions for Kluge's thinking, for Kluge's work, Kluge as a member of sorts of the yeah, 1960s new left uh, intelligentsia, if you will. Um, but Kluge also as somebody who uh, from quite early on uh, engaged precisely also with, um, yeah, with uh, revolutions as uh, perhaps um, not necessarily fully uh, living up to their potential, with revolution indeed as something that may uh, something that may precisely hold uh, a certain potency, a certain potentiality for us, insofar as uh, there is also a latency, right? A latency embedded in a revolution that has not uh, been fully actualized, that has never been fully actualized. Kluge, of course, indeed, was very much um, sort of a, a denizen of a certain late 60s scene in which uh, the publications, publications and other uh, products, uh, other products and productions of the uh, political avant-garde of the 1920s and 1930s were everywhere, right? A culture in which uh, illegal, frequently illegal reprints of authors such as Bertolt Brecht, Walter Benjamin, Wilhelm Reich uh, would be, you know, on, on display on, on sort of makeshift tables outside of universities uh, everywhere. Um, so there is this kind of Benjaminian jetzt Zeit, right, that Kluge is certainly also very familiar with from the late 60s, the sense that, yes, there is a return of this past, right? We mirror ourselves, we recognize ourselves in the work of Brecht, of Benjamin, in this kind of revolutionary productivism. 
Uh, but then there is also always the sense of, okay, we are fundamentally dealing here with uh, eine gescheiterte Hoffnung, right? Die gescheiterte Hoffnung. So there is this montage here of images of uh, revolution and indeed images of, um, yeah, the revolution having sort of uh, frozen. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this whole history of this painting by Caspar David Friedrich that is also discussed here in the catalog, different version different versions of his Eismeer, one of which was called Die Gescheiterte Hoffnung. And um, these are some stills from a DVD Kluge made some years ago, uh, back in the days when uh, yeah, uh, Zurkamp also published various DVDs and DVD sets uh, by Kluge as a kind of yeah, post-cinematic audiovisual books. Um, and this is from the DVD Wer sich traut, uh, reist die Kälte vom Pferd, uh, 2010, indeed. And in, in uh, Wer sich traut, reist die Kälte vom Pferd, we have this, you know, also very sort of, in a way, crude montage of these ice flows from Caspar David Friedrich um, Eismeer, uh, these ice flows having been inserted into various uh, cityscapes, mostly uh, at one point there's also a combination of Friedrich ice flows with, an, with a photo of a contemporary iceberg, right, an iceberg that is uh, possibly melting due to global warming. Um, and um, it is actually um, in relation to these uh, montages from Wer sich traut, uh, reist die Kälte vom Pferd, that, um, um, that Philip Eckhart made some very pertinent remarks in his book on Kluge, um, noting that certain works by Kluge constitute, and I quote Eckhart, a critique of the normative power of facticity, right? There is again this trope indeed uh, from Kluge's own work. They constitute a critique of the normative power of facticity and Eckhart continues, what Kluge redeems here from former days and works, such as Friedrich's work, what Kluge redeems here from former days and works is their potential for future difference. Right? This is precisely it. It is not a sort of, uh, let's say, uh, a simplified notion of yet sight in which there is a, a, a sort of an exact recurrence of the same. It is indeed the potential for future difference. Right? It is the potential for these works and days uh, to make a difference in the present that matters. More precisely, Eckhart continues, uh, the category of possibility understood as potential and as such unrealized anticipation of a later present is assigned to the past. So the category of possibility understood as potential is assigned to the past, right? So this is precisely where Kluge indeed homes in on this potential of the past uh, for future difference. Um, and this is something that I want to just flesh out a little bit further now, also in relation to uh, some older works, in order to then return to these recent uh, these recent short videos or films uh, with um, uh, AI, with stable diffusion. Um, and um, yeah, returning indeed also to the 60s, to the context of the late 1960s and to this you know, symbolic year, in fact, of 1968, when some really thought that they were reenacting the October Revolution. Um, or perhaps the Paris Commune. Uh, this is the year in which Kuga uh, directed his film, The Artisten, not The Artististen, um, that's a typo, The Artisten in der Zirkus Kuppel Ratlos, Artists Under the Big Top Perplexed, is one English translation of the title, but Klugian titles are very difficult to translate into English. Um, and actually, I have to apologize for the fact that the clip that I'm going to show now from this film also comes with some very bad English subtitles, and they're also totally out of sync. Now, this fragment, this sequence, would be difficult enough to subtitle as it is because uh, it is also very layered. The soundtrack is very polyphonic. Uh, so we hear basically elephants in a sense. Elephants are speaking to us uh, on the soundtrack, uh, telling a story about some um, um, legendary fire in the elephant house in Chicago. The elephants being reassured by the director that it's not a real emergency and then they, you know, they are basically turned into uh, um, into a kind of um, a bacon, essentially. Um, so this drama um, is then also combined with children, perhaps again also um, 
channeling the elephant, singing a kind of song about the end of the Hitler state. Uh, der Tag ist nah, da ist kein Hitlerstaat mehr da. So in, again, a kind of anticipation of a future in which the fascist state, the Hitlerstaat, will be gone. So these voices are sort of interwoven on the soundtrack. And we see images, again, the... Um, um, the montage, the visual montage, is again layered and polyphonic in a way. Um, it is a montage of images of the circus elephants. The film is set in a circus. Um, circus elephants, these images are alternated actually with some clips from Eisenstein's film uh, October. So there is indeed here this yeah, now time, this jetzt Zeit of sorts um, between the present and um, not so much the October Revolution, but Eisenstein's cinematic reenactment of the October Revolution. And um, yeah, the setting in the circus with these elephants might um, you know, appear quite um, odd at first. I mean, it's certainly not sort of, it's certainly not a, a stereotypical cliched image, right, of 1968. It's not what we necessarily think of, what we conjure up uh, with our mind's eye when we think 1968. Um, Kluge here indeed homes in on the world of the circus as a world that you know, appears to be a kind of residual, old, dying reality, right? The circus, it's not a part, really, of the, the modern or contemporary culture uh, industry, right? It, it appears to be arcane and archaic, but Kluge has also noted in writing, actually, the circus, as we still perhaps know it today, I mean, it, it is perhaps disappearing, but the circus, as we still know it, is actually a modern... Uh, invention. It is actually, as he has put it, the abstract representation of the ideals of the French Revolution in which the omnipotent new man makes elephants balance on one leg, in which, you know, this new man um, appears to overcome gravity, right, with somersaults and everything. So for Kluge, the circus actually is this dialectical image of the new man overcoming gravity and also making animals do his or uh, his bidding, right? So this is, of course, also where Kluge's uh, Adornianism comes into play, right? Having worked closely with Adorno in the 1960s, um, for me, uh, these kinds of images and this whole trope also of the elephant in his work, which we can actually pursue throughout his oeuvre, um, the trope of the animal in general in his work, also really evokes this phrase of Adorno's die geschundene Kreatur, right? The animal under capitalist modernity as die geschundene Kreatur, which of course also applies to the, the human animal, right? A creature that has been stinted, that has been maimed, precisely here in the context of the project of overcoming uh, gravity, overcoming sort of creaturely limitations. So, okay, after this lengthy introduction, let me just find the right moment and play that clip for you. So. des Elefantenhauses von Chicago. Alarm, Alarm, Feuer. Wie du sagt der Direktor, es ist nur eine Übung, es ist nur scheinbar Feuer. Die Dickhäuter, die das Feuer auf ihrer Haut spüren, sind verzweifelt. Des Geistes heilen ohne das Narben bleiben, aber die Wunden des Körpers vergiften den Geist. Ich 
Worte schwören, wir vergessen nichts. Das werden wir dem Feuerlöscher nicht vergessen und dem Direktor, der gerufen hat. Es war nur Schein. Es war kein Schein vergessen. Oder vielmehr, es war Feuerschein. Die nicht brennen. Die Wahrheit ist der Tag ist nah. Da ist kein Hitlerstaat mehr da. Unsere Erinnerungen an die Schmerzen und das Feuer müssen wir in Kisten packen und in Kisten versinken. Die Faschisten, welche brennen, müssen wir in Kisten packen und in tiefe See versenken. Die nicht brennen, aber auch nicht löschen, sind wie jene, welche brennen, müssen wir in Kisten packen und in tiefe See versenken. Unsere Erinnerung an die Schmerzen und das Feuer müssen wir in Kisten packen und in tiefe See versenken. Oder aber Rache, Rache. Aber der wird totgeschossen, der bei Rache wird betroffen. Lieber schießen als vergessen. Lieber in die See versenken. Unsere Erinnerung an die Schmerzen und das Feuer müssen wir in Kisten packen und in tiefe See versenken. Aber besser ist es, wenn wir lieber in die See versenken. Yeah, here we also saw this uh, statue of Napoleon, which of course Eisenstein uses sort of to mock um, the Menshevik uh, president uh, at the time. Um, and um, yeah, here we have this indeed um, uh, appropriation of Eisensteinian cinema, the Eisensteinian uh, dialectical montage into uh, something that is um, uh, very sort of indeed um, layered and almost um, 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 almost to the point of excess in a way. And I mentioned subtitles, and when I made the PowerPoint, there were subtitles. They were bad and they were out of sync, but now they have disappeared entirely, it seems. Apologies for that. Uh, but yeah, it is essentially impossible to uh, subtitle this properly. Um, but we have, yeah, the elephants sort of speaking, protesting. Uh, protesting actually against um, sort of a certain dialectic of enlightenment having become the dialectic of fascism, we might say. Uh, there is this song about the future uh, sort of uh, abolition or overcoming of the Hitlerstaat. Um, and um, there is um, a, um, the creation indeed of um, a certain historical indeterminacy, we might almost say, right? There are all these sort of lost futures and potential futures uh, and also all too real oppressive realities sort of interacting with each other in a way that suggests that indeed there may, there may be room to maneuver, right? As Kluge put it recently when I had him on the phone, uh, he actually said, yeah, dann, dann haben wir Raum zu manövrieren, und zwar nicht auf dem Schlachtfeld, right? So for him, a crucial question is also, how can, how can we, right, as, as non-generals, as non-leaders of men, maneuver, not on the battlefield, but in other ways, even though arguably at times there is also perhaps a certain fetishization of the battlefield, uh, of, the, of the Schlacht. Um, now to sort of move forward, to kind of begin to um, return from this moment of 1968 and from that moment in Kluge's oeuvre to something approaching uh, the present. Um, here we have sort of a more um, extensive engagement with Eisenstein, not with Eisenstein's October, but with Eisenstein's uh, unsuccessful attempt post-October to make a film version of Marx's Capital. Right, so this is um, Kluge making, you know, not sort of a fake, right? It's not Kluge attempting to produce his version of Eisenstein's film version of Marx's Capital so many decades after the fact. Uh, it is not a, a historical fake, uh, but it is precisely uh, an attempt to uh, examine, to re-examine this moment uh, and to speculate on um, what sort of a, hist a contemporary engagement with this perhaps impossible project of making a film version of Marx's Capital might uh, look like. And it takes then the, the sort of the post-cinematic form indeed of this DVD set, a uh, three DVD set, uh, which contains many interviews, uh, for instance, also with Eisenstein experts, uh, such as Oksana Bulgakova here, but it also contains interviews with many other talking heads, many artists and thinkers, 
Um, and uh, there are also many sort of playful sequences with um, yeah, these sort of graphic autonomous intertitles. Well, they're no longer really intertitles, but they sort of constitute a, a new form of writing, a, a kind of yeah, cinematic or post-cinematic form of writing um, describing or evoking what some scenes and some sequences from Eisenstein's um, capital might have looked like or could look like. Eh? But we don't get the image. We get a written image. We get a, a, an image in writing. And there are also some uh, yeah, um, acted scenes, some um, enactments or reenactments. For instance, these two actors um, uh, playing the role of um, uh, Stasi, Anwärter, Anwärterin, um, uh, cramming for an exam that would make them uh, officers in the East German secret police. And in order to do that, they have to somehow learn Marx by heart, uh, kind of Marx Latein. And they cannot really make sense of Marx's writing, but they somehow need to, memor they need to memorize this kind of what is to them basically a dead letter. Um, so in all of these ways, and in many more, um, Kluge creates this constellation, right? It really is a nonlinear uh, constellation of um, scenes and sequences that um, allow us indeed to perhaps, yeah, to rethink and to reimagine this abandoned, uh, possibly um, impossible project by Eisenstein and to, um, yeah, to see whether indeed we can discern some untimely anachronistic uh, potential uh, in, that, in that moment, in that lost historical moment. Um, let's see. I'm be I will begin to sort of uh, work my way towards the end. Um, so yes, I would say that um, something like Nachrichten aus der Ideologischen Antike, which is a really major work by Kluge, is also crucial to sort of keep in mind as uh, part of the background, part of the context of these um, new recent um, AI uh, videos, which um, are themselves, of course, let's say, um, not as fully integrated in this overall Klugian constellation, right? What Kluge did with uh, Nachrichten aus der Ideologischen Antike, news uh, from ideological antiquity, is that he um, combined um, many uh, films, uh, interviews, clips that he already had from his televisual work, from his TV work, and he crafted this DVD set from all of those materials and also new footage and new elements. Um, but basically, it is sort of a partial integration of disparate elements resulting in something that is not a seamless synthesis, uh, but yeah, it is a montage that demands to be engaged with as um, an elaborate constellation. What we see with these recent uh, AI films or videos is that Kluge produces short films, short videos, and he is, in a sense, looking for a context. That's also why he's really happy and grateful that these um, uh, pieces can be shown in an exhibition uh, such as History Tales, uh, because at this moment in his life, we might say, he's perhaps um, no longer uh, really crafting these overall constellations himself. So he's very um, um, yeah, eager to sort of insert them into certain contexts such as exhibitions. And here in my talk, I'm also in my own way uh, trying to indeed create a constellation that allows us to uh, engage with uh, some, of the, um, um, yeah, some of the elements of those pieces uh, and relate them to, um, uh, to other pieces, both by Kluge and by others, uh, and to get a sense of the, um, um, from the of the overall constellation. Now, um, one um, point that I indeed want to also problematize in relation to these recent pieces is that we do see an increasing emphasis here on history as made on the battlefield, right? Even though we can again also trace this back in Kluge's work back to the 1960s, um, had this focus on the Schlachtfeld. So Kluge, of course, on the one hand, as an intellectual, a writer and artist of the New Left, of the post-war New Left, uh, has very much also been uh, involved in 
uh, projects, often together with uh, Alexander Nicht, that focus on history from below, right, on popular agency, uh, but Kluge, as well as uh, sort of a German intellectual, uh, has a certain uh, kind of complementary fixation, I would say, on history from above, right? The history of sovereigns, uh, history as made on the battlefield. But he also then, um, in um, that context, foregrounds indeed moments of breakdown. He focuses on battles that do not go according to, according to plan, right? And he also has this beautiful phrase. Krieg ist das Ende aller Pläne, right? War is the end of all plans, of all planning. So on the one hand, there is this lengthy history of military war games, right? Planspiele, which actually goes back to the Prussian uh, high command in the era of the Napoleonic Wars. So we're talking about uh, sort of two centuries, at least, of um, yeah, jeu de guerre, right? As Guy Debord would put it. Um, but war is precisely the breakdown of all plans, right? Nothing really goes as plans, and this is also where um, history as made on the battlefield becomes a kind of strange uh, comedy, which is something that Kluge, for instance, develops in collaboration with the uh, German actor and comedian Helge Schneider, who here in this video uh, plays Napoleon uh, with an outrageous French accent. Uh, you know, it's really sort of Inspector Clouseau style. Uh, and um, Napoleon basically here, or Schneider as Napoleon, uh, talks about uh, his Russian, his disastrous Russian campaign. And ultimately, according to Schneider as Napoleon, it all, you know, boiled down to the fact that he'd, he had given his soldiers warm, furry hats, but he had overlooked the importance of warm boots. So basically, you know, their uh, feet uh, froze, and uh, that's um, basically that oversight cost him. Uh, his uh, his empire. Um, so, uh, okay, I will play a few minutes from this, perhaps, to at least give some of us a sense of this kind of performance. Right, this is again from the context of Kluge's work as a, a TV director and producer over several decades in in Germany, uh, where he used a certain sort of legal loophole to insert these kinds of productions into commercial uh, television. So there is a huge archive of that. Um, so this is um, Helge Schneider um, about Napoleon maneuvering, in this case, on the battlefield uh, and maneuvering uh, unsuccessfully. But for Kluge, of course, even though I'm also somewhat skeptical about this increasing focus on the Schlacht, uh, on the battlefield, the emphasis is still on historical contingency and on um, unrealized uh, potentialities, right? So in that sense, there is also perhaps an allegorical dimension here, and it can be, there is also a possible sort of translation of this kind of history of sovereignty, of blundering, bumbling sovereignty in some cases, into a sort of a, a register of... I'm coming from the USA. I am coming from the USA. She's coming from the USA. Now she's back. Wie kommt das, dass Sie immer sozusagen Ihre Schlachten eigentlich regelmäßig gewinnen, bis auf die letzte? Weil ich vorher mir alles genau ausdenke und dann weiß ja, da kann ich gut jetzt äh, die Truppe hinschicken und äh, ihm äh, einen kleinen äh, Fake äh, von hinten rum auch eine andere Truppe schicken und dann die in die Zange nehmen, der Feind, und dann alles tot machen. Sie sprechen ja mit korsischem Akzent. Oui, äh, ich bin auch, auch in der Kurse eigentlich, aber braucht man nicht alle zu wissen. Ja, ja. Aber irgendwie ein scharfes Auge. Ja. Das Auge der Schlachten. Ja, ja, aber ich muss auch äh, da jetzt Ihnen sagen, dass ich leicht, ich muss gucken, ob es auch wirklich, äh, ob alles sicher ist hier. Ja. Aber Denn viele Leute. Wollen. Ein Mann des Südens, ja, ja. empfindlich. An sich in Russland, das war ja. gar nichts. Es war ein großer Fehler von mir, in, äh, mit äh, den äh, Klamotten nach Russland. Da muss er warme Sachen hätten. Pilze. Hätte. Ja. Ja. Okay, I'm going to stop it there, uh, because otherwise it will be a bit long, perhaps for those of us who don't. Uh, speak German or German with a with a French Inspector Clouseau accent. I have trouble following that. Um, but yeah, here we see sort of a, a certain type of performance uh, that uh, sort of tilts um, sort of history, even history as as a tragedy, right, uh, into 
um, history as as uh, as comedy, as bad comedy, perhaps. Um, and um, yeah, this we can also relate quite directly to um, some of these recent uh, AI pieces, in particular. Um, one of the videos that is in the exhibition currently, but also another one that will be added in um, uh, February, which is titled General Schlacht und Pferd, Szene mit Zinsoldaten, which I will uh, play for you now um, in a combination with another recent uh, AI stable diffusion video titled Theatro Optique. So I made a little montage here myself. So this is not necessarily supposed to be a two channel um, sort of uh, piece, uh, but this is a combination I made for this purpose. So General Schlacht und Pferd indeed shows us scenes with toy soldiers, right, tin soldiers. So this is uh, indeed um, basically a 19th century children's toy that encouraged young boys, right, to develop their military sort of interests uh, by playing out battles, right, with their tin soldiers. Uh, their toy soldiers, and of course, this also introduces a certain ludic element, right? And a ludic element that we also see in something like this interview with Helge Schneider as Napoleon, right? This is also in a way, uh, yeah, this is playing with history, right? This is replaying history, right, in a ludic register, suggesting indeed that there might be room to maneuver uh, also beyond the battlefield. And then with stable diffusion, of course, we get all kinds of mutations of these horses, of these generals, um, and uh, we get a sort of uh, yeah, kitschy, uh, uh, apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic sci-fi scenes. And I made a montage here with another recent video, Théâtre Optique, which uh, kind of uh, shows us, again, stable diffusion mutations of circus scenes, uh, supposedly based on the early cinematic or proto-cinematic uh, device Théâtre Optique from the 1890s. And here, again, we also have um, animals, animals and humans uh, seemingly overcoming gravity in the circus, right? So again, we have this trope of the, the new man and of the, the geschundene Kreatur somehow being uh, drilled and being sort of transmuted into something um, that uh, overcomes all these earthly and all too human or all too animalistic um, uh, limitations. Uh, and yeah, then with General Schlacht und Pferd, we have also the horse as this militarized animal, right? As this weaponized animal, the animal of empire, of sovereignty on the battlefield, forming this uh, kind of cyborg assemblage with the general uh, undergoing all of these mutations on the battlefield. And I will actually just start playing them. And uh, we can also do that without sound. So we can have a little look. And I will um, uh, begin to wrap things up. Um, so yeah, here we have General Schlacht und Pferd on the left and then Theater Optik on the right. So the one on the left will be shown also in the exhibition um, soon, shortly. And yes, what I want to emphasize also again here is that indeed these videos or films, these post-cinematic AI videos by Kluge, are in a sense also fragments, fragments of a larger constellation, right? The larger constellation of this sort of unfolding late oeuvre of all of these uh, weird little AI um, videos. Um, and um, here in just uh, concretizing, actualizing, right? In actualizing the potential dialogue between do, these two uh, particular pieces, I also want to yeah, emphasize the uh, importance of indeed engaging in this kind of um, uh, constellatory thinking, right? In this kind of constellatory labor uh, with these pieces, which is also, I think, what Sabine Fouli uh, is doing in the, in the exhibition in a different way. Mm -hmm. This is when they, in a, in a sense, really begin, to, really begin to sing, right? When these resonances are really being uh, teased out. Play these, play these out, it's another minute or so. They are quite beautiful to watch. But 
taking it all in conjunction with each other. I would say. Yeah, in my text for the catalog, I also write at a certain point um, in relation to General Schlacht und Pferd that um, what emerges here is indeed the possibility of a history from below, a history from under the horse's hoofs, from the vantage point of subjugated subjects. I quote actually from a great rant by Mark E. Smith, the singer of the band The Fall, who in uh, their uh, 1988 score for the ballet production um, commemorating William and Mary's glorious revolution of 1688, sneeringly uh, sings, um, they wrote over peasants like you, they wrote over peasants like you, and their horses loved them too, right? So in other words, he was actually also singing this or shouting this to an audience in Amsterdam with Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands being in attendance, right? So uh, whereas there was this whole sort of Dutch um, um, a society that was assembled there, uh, headed by the Queen, right, the Dutch sovereign, Smith, um, sort of sneeringly, Hectorton, uh, shouting, they wrote over peasants like you, meaning, right, these generals and monarchs, royal sovereigns on horseback would have, you know, ridden right over peasants like you, right, don't kid yourselves. And indeed, um, this um, evokes the possibility of a history from below, a history written from the vantage point of not of the generals on horseback, but from the vantage point of those under the horse's hoofs, the subjugated subjects. Um, this to me also raises the question, yeah, what images or questions to feed stable diffusion with, right? What about images that were never produced in the first place or that were lost, right? So, okay, we can use Rubens's sketch for the triumphal entry of Henri IV in Paris. We can use a scene of uh, toy soldiers, which is already something very different. Um, but indeed, how to produce comments, right? Digitale commentare, as Kluge calls these pieces. How to produce comments on potential history that actually have escaped the sort of visual archive of Western visual culture, right? Um, what about, yeah, histories, images, potential images and potential histories that cannot be found in the Western cultural archive or that have been rejected from it? Now, um, this is indeed where it is also important to engage with uh, some other strands in Kluge's work, also his collaborations indeed with Oskar Neck, such as their monumental 1981 opus Geschichte und Eigensinn, which is a very wide-ranging inquiry into uh, the development of what they call uh, labor powers, um, Arbeitsvermögen in the plural throughout history, right? Not the singular, not the singular labor powers, but actually several, yeah, potentialities, potentials to perform different kinds of labor. How they have been developed actually throughout sort of evolution and throughout human history, not just in the history of capitalism. Um, and yeah, in the context of this project, they do engage also very specifically with uh, certain forms of industrial labor, with slavery, with all forms of subjugation, but also with uh, indeed the human potential to develop powers that allow uh, human beings to survive and perhaps to more than survive under uh, dehumanizing circumstances. So this kind of um, sort of granular engagement also with history, also with the history of the oppressed, right, with the tradition of the oppressed, to use Walter Benjamin's term, is perhaps something that is fading slightly from view now uh, at this uh, moment in, uh, in Kluge's uh, life and, and work, but it is definitely there in his overall uh, practice, if we take sort of the long view, and to end on also a resonance that I see with another artist from a very different generation, um, when it is again also about placing these pieces by Kluge in some kind of constellation of his own works, but also of other, um, other works and other practices, I was struck by um, yeah, um, a project um, that I encountered recently by the Amsterdam-based artist Sonja Kazowski. Uh, you can see her name there on this paper. So this publication, this newspaper-style publication is one iteration of um, 
a project that she has that also invor involves a fairly complex, elaborate theatrical production, and this, in a way, is, is kind of the score uh, of that. The whole project is based on a mid-19th century American publication by female laborers, by, by women workers, called the Lowell Offering. Um, so the Lowell Offering actually is, uh, yeah, was a magazine, a periodical, uh, from this sort of emerging um, kind of basically Klassenkampf, right, but not uh, sort of the, let's say, archetypal, standardized uh, Klassenkampf by the working men, right, the original name of the first international, the International Working Men's Association, right, this was actually a publication by working women working in these textile mills, but it was a publication mostly by white uh, women workers in the U.S., which is also something that Kazowski uh, problematizes in this publication, in this uh, script, uh, this script in which we, for instance, also encounter voices from a future past, right, voices calling out for abolition or reform, um, and we have actually several voices. It is, it is a very polyphonic script, uh, but as part of this uh, project, um, uh, Kazowski also indeed worked with AI image generators to produce these kind of modified, uh, mutated, um, uh, yeah, post-photographic uh, images that accompany uh, the script. Um, these are images that no longer can no longer really be uh, contained, I would say, by traditional notions of representation, right? Um, and um, in that sense, for me, there is something that yeah, that begins to emerge here, right? A potential dialogue also between these two uh, practices um, by yeah, Kluge as this German post-war artist filmmaker, actually born before the Second World War, having experienced uh, the bombarding of, of his hometown of Halberstadt during the Second World War, which he also returns to frequently, and then Sonia Kazowski as this uh, yeah, Russian-Israeli artist, female artist living in in Amsterdam, engaging with these histories of gendered labor, racialized labor, um, and indeed um, returning uh, to those moments to, I would actually argue also, uh, sound out uh, possibilities that were perhaps, perhaps not fully realized at that moment, right? That were not fully potentials, potentialities that were not fully actualized. There was no perfect alliance at that moment, no coalition of white, working women and yeah, black um, women, for instance, or black workers or uh, the enslaved, uh, to put it in those terms. Uh, that potential was not fully actualized, certainly, at that moment. Uh, but I would say that um, this is not only a history of failure, right? This, to me, is really what ultimately connects Kazowski's project with Kluge's project Overall, we're not dealing um, we're not dealing with sort of a melancholic, let's say, left melancholic um, meditation on failure. It's not about that. It is about challenging what Kluge indeed called the realistic result, the actual result, as an abstraction that has murdered all other possibilities for the moment. But with Kazowski as well as with Kluge. It is very much also about the sense that these possibilities will recur. It is about insisting that these possibilities will recur. It is about working towards the recurrence of those possibilities. And this is where I'll end. Thank you.